Okay, cool. Then, Vera, could you please explain first uh, what we are doing here, then I introduce Kelsey and then she goes for it. Yeah, I'll just keep it brief. Welcome everyone. It's the 10th science chat we have now, um, which is pretty cool. Um, we started the science chats to actually also in this time of Corona still keep connecting people that care about rivers, either scientists or river defenders or people that want to use their knowledge to actually um, protect the rivers in the long term. Um, so yeah, we're getting a range of topics and it goes pretty broad, but it kind of gives different perspectives on, um, on river protection. Um, so we're quite excited about this one, just as a first note though, where we've got the applications open for the students for Rivers Camp, which will happen between the 12th and the 19th of September. And we can say uh, Montenegro, which is the place where we're going, is actually the first country that doesn't have any COVID cases anymore. So we're quite positive that we can actually go. So just keep spreading the word and make sure people apply that would potentially want to come in. Aha, there we have more people from Chile. <laughs> Hi, good to see you guys. <laughs> okay, sorry, this was a... That's my um, country, look at them. <laughs> I'll give the word now to Jens. <laughs> Those are native Chileans. Um, well, uh, today we have the honor to have Kelsey Leonard with us. Um, she will talk about like, sacrality, sacrality in water and for Native Americans. Uh, she will be more specific on the term. Um, Kelsey is a member of the Shinnecock Indian Nation and she has a master in water science policy and management. And if I'm not wrong, uh, Kelsey, you are currently doing your PhD in comparative public policy, right? I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm finished now, so I'm doing uh, a postdoc. You're a postdoc, okay. Yeah. Then uh, you should uh, actualize your website <laughs> because I, uh, <laughs> I got the information from there. <laughs> yeah, no uh, worries. <laughs> Cool, thank you. Um, well, you can uh, share with us uh, your screen now and start your presentation. Um, briefly, before that, we will have uh, Kelsey's talk and then we will have an open discussion. So if you have any question during the talk, feel free to write them down in the chat. And after the talk, you can just uh, raise your hand and uh, ask yourself the question to Kelsey. So, thank you all. Great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction and to everyone that's joining uh, the conversation today. I'm really happy to be here. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of, of sacredness of water. Um, and one of the points that I want to sort of raise in, in our collective consciousness today is um, an activity that's been uh, sort of originated here in the Great Lakes region. Um, that's sort of the Laurentian Great Lakes uh, of North America, what we call Turtle Island, and that's sort of what you can see in this cover image, um, a practice called water walking or, or walking for the water. And um, I think it does really showcase our understanding and philosophy as indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, so that specifically is North America, what currently is known as Canada and the United States, um, as well as sort of um, those nations to, to our southern borders. Um, it really does sort of capture our philosophy and understanding of, of water. So with that, uh, again, um, thank you for, for the introduction um, earlier. Uh, so my uh, name is, uh, is Dr. Kelsey Leonard. I'm currently based at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Um, I did my PhD here at McMaster and am now finishing a, a postdoc. And I, but I originally come from the Shinnecock Nation and our territory is located on Long Island in uh, what is currently known as New York. You can see in the image here, um, the purple area is our current territory. That, um, so our uh, nation's territory, it's our sovereign uh, land. That's where our community is. That's where um, most, many of our citizens uh, live. I have you know, family that, that lives there. So um, that's sort of, where our, our current land holdings are in purple, but the entirety of the map, so that's all of the east end of Long Island, was our traditional territory. Um, and so what's currently known as Long Island, we call Pominock. Um, and so I feel like that's really important for you to, to orient you to where I come from, uh, particularly because we're a coastal Algonquin uh, indigenous nation. 
we are traditionally whalers. We're very much known for our uh, fishing, um, uh, particularly uh, our shellfish hatcheries, and our harvesting of um, a, a shell um, called, um, or a clam called a quahog, which is uh, what you may have seen uh, carved into wampum. So the purple and white beads that make up many of the treaty belts across North America. Um, so those original treaties with colonists and indigenous peoples were made out of um, these shells, um, carved shells into beads um, and that are called wampum. And so that's a bit of orienting you to where I come from and my territory and what my nation is, is known for. Um, and so now I found myself uh, in, in the Great Lakes and I do research on um, water, particularly uh, looking at water governance impacts climate change on, on water justice for indigenous peoples um, throughout uh, North America, but predominantly centered in the Great Lakes and, and Northeast regions. And I think that all centers from, from my identity as a Shinnecock woman and scientist because our territory, as you can see here, is where freshwater meets saltwater. Um, and, and I think that's going to play into a lot of what I'm going to share with you today around our understanding of, of water um, and how we have a more holistic perspective, as Lisa, Shinnecock people, and then from some of the other indigenous people that I've met through uh, my career and, and, and research. So I want to start, and I, I think we might use the, the chat box for this, uh, just to kind of keep it a bit controlled, but um, I want to ask you a question of what is water? If someone asked you what is water, how would you respond? Feel free to type into the chat box. I think we're slowly getting some folks to it's not a trick question. H2O, good, yep. <laughs> Life, okay. Water is what flows through rivers and what we can drink. Nature, yeah. H2O and a source of all life. Good. You might also, um, blood of the earth, okay. Bending element in the Avatar movie, like. <laughs> Source of culture, society, geological treasure, rivers, are veins. Yeah, and I think this is probably a, a little bit of, um, a, a bit of the collective that's joined here, right? There's maybe more of an understanding of some of the ephemeral characteristics of, of water. Um, Sometimes, though, I will get folks that say, oh, you know, it's a river, it's a waterfall, it's snow, it's ice, it's H2O, definitely. Um, it's a glacier, it's uh, um, condensation, you know, so the different physical aspects of water, which is all true. And I think that we often ask the question or, or are asked the question, what is water when we're looking at making management decisions and thinking about science and thinking about research and thinking about data. Um, we're, we're looking at, okay, well, what, what, is the, what is the water body? What is the, the makeup of this water? Um, it's very physical characteristic. And that is a very, that's framed from a very Western perspective. So, so it's not a wrong perspective, but it's a different perspective. So when we're trying to co-mobilize different knowledge systems and different worldviews, um, the question that I like to put forward to water scientists and water managers and other folks that are working in water policy is how do your thoughts about water change when I ask you the question, who is water? In the same way that I might ask you, who is your aunt? Who is your grandmother? Who is your sister? See, that fundamentally changes the way in which you think about water. And right now you're probably like, oh, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know if I get this, or I get this a lot. This is so cool. That's the differentiation in the most stark terms of Western worldviews and indigenous worldviews when it comes to water and understanding valuations of water. It's it's actually seeing water in the what versus the who. Indigenous epistemologies are actually saying water is alive. And not only is it alive, but it's, it's kin, it's a relation 
that we have a responsibility towards and a duty towards. And sometimes that's a stewardship duty, sometimes it's, it's another type of duty or responsibility um, that's based within indigenous law and indigenous legal systems of caring for the world and existing in, in the world. Um, but those are foundational to how we make decisions about water, what types of science we should be doing, what types of data we should be collecting. Um, when it, so it all comes down to the questions that we ask and whether or not we're asking the right questions. Um, and in this, in its most basic form, can actually show you how, as we start to ask more detailed questions, as we start to ask more um, complex questions, how are we accounting for different epistemologies, different worldviews in, um, in asking those questions? So I will say um, in, in putting this together, I wanted to provide you with a little bit of background from my particular context of, of Turtle Island of North America and, and our perspectives on, um, on water. Now, this isn't every indigenous person in North America is going to feel this way, but there is an overwhelming consensus that, that we have these, these principles, these understandings of, um, of water as being a living relation, as being alive, as being um, uh, the cornerstone of life. Um, we often hear phrasing, and you may have heard this in, um, very frequently after the Standing Rock Movement, so against the Dakota Access Pipeline construction, um, so you can see that here in this image of, of the sort of no dapple movement. Um, you may have heard very frequently the phrasing water is life and also water is our first medicine. Now, those are terms that we've been using for millennia. They're, they're, they're integrated into our indigenous legal systems here on Turtle Island and uh, they're not necessarily new terms. So they're not terms that emerged out of Standing Rock. They're terms though that were really highlighted during Standing Rock because so many folks were getting an on-the-ground um, hyper-education in these values and in these legal systems. So um, when we say water is our first medicine, uh, the artwork that you can see here is done by a Métis artist, Christy Bellacor. She's uh, phenomenal and she really um, tries to capture through art our indigenous laws around, around water. Um, and so in these particular instances, she's capturing our understanding of water being our first medicine because it, it, it nurtures us in the womb for those nine months um, that we are carried by women um, and then birthed into existence on the planet. So one of the things as indigenous people that we're really conscious of is that we have this natal connection to water. We're, we're born, you know, we, 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 um, we, we exist in water um, and then we're born from water. And so trying to understand how, and that's across humanity, that's not just indigenous people, right? That's human beings, that's, our, that's how we're constructed on, on the planet. Um, at least for now, we can talk about some of the, the futuristic aspects of, of reproduction. Um, but uh, in, you know, in, our, in our biological form, we have this natal connection to water. So as indigenous people, that connection is something that we are taught to steward throughout the entirety of our life. And so where we look at other communities, other societies who lose that connection and aren't stewarding it throughout their life, um, that's where uh, there can be conflict or confusion or misunderstanding in our different sciences and knowledge mobilizations and legal systems because um, we're trying to figure out if we're all born with this connection, what makes some of us lose it and some of us not. Um, and I think a part of it, uh, you know, our, understanding our value systems, the economics of our societies, the, what we place value on and what we don't place value on. So I think to fully understand indigenous economics, to, particularly within Turtle Island, you definitely have to understand our valuation of water, uh, that it's um, not necessarily m a monetary uh, economic system, but that the economic system uh, is much more all-encompassing all than that and actually goes into um, uh, an integration, you know, with with our laws and and then also with these epistemologies. So, um, I think also too, what you can see from uh, Christie's imagery as well is our connection to other non-human relations. So the fact that um, by not taking care of the water or not caring for the water or not maintaining that natal connection, we can do damage to other non-human relations like fish species. Um, that then we ingest and can also cause, if they're not taken care of, cause us harm. And so we see that a lot in many of our First Nations communities, indigenous communities in, in, in North America, 
that are facing you know massive um, environmental um, uh, toxic injustices around mercury poisonings and, and other types of environmental contaminants uh, that have depleted water quality. So there's this, um, and that is not just a physical violence towards um, reproduction towards the, the human body, but it also then manifests because of our differences in epistemologies as a spiritual violence, um, a, a violence that also has major ramifications for uh, not only physical well-being, but mental and spiritual well-being. And uh, there's a lot of really great research happening in that space right now. Uh, we've seen it um, leaning towards uh, the climate crisis and the way in which people are, are differently impacted and disproportionately impacted by uh, mental health concerns related to the climate crisis and subsequent similar studies are connecting that to water too and the water crises. So the next question I have for you and it, it's a bit of a sorry rhetorical question. to interrupt question. you, Kelsey, sorry to interrupt yes. you, but I think some of the audience are not, many are not native English speakers, so could you please speak a bit slower, please? Sure, no problem. Yeah, thank you. So the next question um, that I have for you is if you lived in a country where one out of every six people you met had drinking water too polluted for human consumption, what country would you be in? And you can feel free to type into the chat box. USA, okay. China, India, yep. Chile? Like from the tap? Yes, yeah, so you don't have the uh, uh, sustainable water infrastructure, so yeah, drinking water. Peru, yeah. India? So these, these are all great answers, and from my research, um, they're all correct. One of the things that I wanted to highlight for you is that the term that I'm thinking of is, is Indian country, and this is a colloquial term that we use as indigenous people um, on Turtle Island in North America to refer to our common experiences, um, often linked to colonialism, but also because of our, our shared histories, maybe kinship networks, maybe past trading experiences, over millennia, maybe shared governance systems. There's a whole, you know, sleuth of ways in which we connect to each other. Um, but we often use this, this phrasing of, of affinity uh, called Indian country. And what that means is, you know, on most uh, reserves and reservations uh, ac across uh, what's currently known as Canada and the United States, where you go to indigenous territories, um, we, one out of um, every six folks, sometimes on some of these reserves and territories, it's more than that. Um, and like in the case of, of the Navajo Nation, which you may be seeing a lot of more recently due to COVID-19, um, their numbers I think are about three in six. Um, so every one in six person generally you'd meet doesn't have access to clean drinking water. Um, for so, some place like the Navajo Nation where it's, it, where it's like three in six or the numbers are much more exponential. Um, that, that's really, really devastating when you have a crisis like COVID-19 where one of the preeminent ways to combat the virus is to wash your hands and you don't have access to, to clean drinking water or to water infrastructure for basic sanitation. So that's something that also informs our understanding of the sacredness of water that we've now gotten to a society, um, a global society, in which that sacredness has been um, polluted, manipulated, uh, violated to such an extent that it's now causing um, human harm. And, and that's a, a major concern for, for many indigenous peoples, not just from a engineering policy side, but from, again, that, that spiritual side. So you will often see a lot of our communities um, speaking up, speaking out against these, uh, these different types of, of contaminants, infractions, pollution in, in our world. Um, but we're often labeled as, as terrorists, as protesters, as um, 
we're we're very much branded as as violent, even if the even if the actions are nonviolent actions. Um, and so, I wanted to kind of reframe that and, and sort of show you um, from an indigenous perspective some of these photos. You know, I'm not a terrorist. I just want clean water. And I think when we start to think of a society and a world that that values the human right to water more, that values um, indigenous understandings and valuations of water that maybe this framing, this language will change as well. Um, I also wanted to note that kind of out of the Standing Rock movement, we really saw folks revise language to say, you know, we're not protesters. There's, there's not an, an, a, a level of, of political activism here. We're protectors. We're trying to, um, to stop um, activities that, that would continue or, or, or cause large harm. So I think that's interesting too for, for you to note the way in which uh, the language of protector versus protester also shifts our understanding of this, um, of these different epistemologies and the sacredness, right? If something is sacred, you're, you're there to protect it, not protest it. And I think that's a, that's a big linkage with indigenous understanding. Um, and then, you know, a lot of this is about children, right? It's about future generations that sacredness of water is also about, you know, understanding the sacredness of life, understanding the sacredness of future generations. And so all of that comes into our legal systems, our economic systems, and our science in, in how we understand um, and, and look to collect new data. So I'd be remiss to not talk about the way in which um, colonialism has impacted the sacredness of our waters, um, particularly one aspect of colonialism, which we call hydrocolonialism. So this is Celilo Falls in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's one of the most ancient fishing villages in all of, of North America. They had um, about over 4,000 years of recorded use of this particular site. So um, it probably would also be listed as one of the most ancient fishing village sites in, in the world, um, had it not been destroyed. So this is Celilo Falls in 1953, and this is Celilo Falls now. Um, it was flooded to create the Dallas Dam, um, and this is what the dam looks like now. So that, that 4,000 years of history of, of sacredness, of cultivating first foods, which is salmon for, for that region of, of the world, um, that has a very spiritual as well as economic and legal, so many different connections being a staple of life, uh, was destroyed with the production of, of, this, of this hydro uh, project. Um, and this is a consistent story throughout Turtle Island, throughout North America. This dam here featured is the Kinzua Dam, um, where the Seneca Nation of Indians were forcibly removed out of um, uh, northeastern Pennsylvania to what is now currently known as, as upstate New York. Um, they didn't want to remove, be removed. They petitioned um, to the President Kennedy at the time, John F. Kennedy, um, and their petition was denied. Um, and for those that, that tried to stay, um, they were forcibly removed by, um, by agents and their homes were burned. Um, and then all of the territory was flooded with the building of the dam. And so the picture on the top left is um, sort of that those flooded territories and there's a vigil that's been held every year since uh, the Kinzua Dam was built um, and this particular project was um, a flood uh, flood management project to keep the city of Pittsburgh um, that's about about mm, 100 miles south of the dam from flooding because it had a, um, a historic amounts of flooding in the early part of the 20th century um, but it was seen as pivotal to the American economic expansion projects. And so they, um, they built the dam. So I turn then to um, Winneman Chief Kayleen Sis. She's an internationally uh, renowned elder, um, spiritual leader, and, and chief for the Winneman Wintu, uh, Wintu people in Northern California. And she calls um, uh, dams uh, the weapons of mass desecration. And I think, again, in talking about this understanding of the sacredness of water, um, the, these dams, these hydro projects really play into our current understandings of, of the manipulation and, and desecration. Um, 
And so they are particularly, the women went to in Northern California, are fighting the raising of the Shasta Dam, which would flood sacred sites. So it's, water is not only, it's, it's not only sacred, but it also has the, it has a sacred power through which it can, um, it can take away sacred sites, right? It, 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 so there's this sort of understanding of, of duality, of multiple modalities of water, um, understanding its power. And, and I think that um, for indigenous people, not being a part of conversations, not being able to have a seat at the decision-making table has uh, been to our detriment in, in so many different ways when it comes to our sacred sites and to the sacredness of water. So we get now to uh, a space in which we see that water is life and there are people doing really awesome things as protectors and through protector movements. Um, where I am right now, this is the Great Lakes. You can see that all of these red stars are indigenous nations that are in our basin. So we have over 200 um, indigenous nations uh, that call the Great Lakes home currently. Um, many more than that that were all, um, may have been removed historically by force uh, due to assimilation policies of the US to Canada. Um, that being said, there are some really great, wonderful indigenous leaders that are doing fantastic work to protect the water. Um, one of my mentors, um, Josephine Nandamanba, she was uh, an elder, and Anishinaabe Kwe from Oklahoma Unceded Territory, um, and she had, um, she was told about a vision that was, that was, um, that um, um, a leader of her ceremonial lodge had, um, that said that in the future, in the near future, um, an ounce of water would be worth as much as an ounce of gold. And that ceremonial leader said to the people that were at the lodge, what are you going to do about it? And so she went back to her home community and she spoke with other indigenous grandmothers um, about this prophecy. And she, she asked them, what should we do? You know, we've, we've had this call of action put to us, put forward to us, what can we do for the water? Um, and so she started uh, what was called, and I wouldn't say she was the only one. Again, remember, there were a lot of grandmothers who were, who were giving her advice at the time. So her, along with these other grandmothers, started what was called the water walks or the Mother Earth water walks. And she walked all five of the Great Lakes multiple times. Uh, about, that's over around uh, 40,000 kilometers in total, walking uh, by, by, by foot. Um, and uh, there's a lot of spiritual components that are embedded into the walks. And they brought together women, children, um, men. It, it's, it's really, it's, there's not a gender aspect to, to this activity, um, but there are gendered teachings. And so there's a lot of spiritual connection, restore, restoration of that natal connection that happens during the walks. Um, and, and then they grew from there. They're now global. They've um, been held throughout Turtle Island, but they've also been held in Europe, in Brazil, and in Japan, in other parts of the world. So it's really fantastic. Um, the two main organizations that sort of spearheaded these activities were the Mother Earth Water Walkers with Josephine Mandemanba, and then the Nibe Walks, which are river walks. So um, the Mother Earth Water Walkers were predominantly lake walks or ocean walks or things like that, but then the Bay Walks are river walks, and those are led by Sharon Day, um, and she is based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So since they started in 2003, uh, the original um, uh, prophecy was, um, was spoken about in 2001, so this is from the early 2000s. There's been over 120 walks, um, probably it's about 150 now since I, I last updated the slide, and the whole purpose is to try and teach people to enact their water citizenship. Um, and what I mean by that is to be like water, to understand that if you can walk a mile in the water's footsteps, you might have more greater consciousness for how to make decisions for water, how to care for water, and how to understand your spiritual connection to water. So what are they? Um, it's actually walking physically close to water in prayer and ceremony. There's traditional teachings that are done through the walks. Um, there's a lot of knowledge exchanging that happens. And I feel like the, the biggest takeaway from the walks is it's sharing and learning by doing. There's so much that we can learn by participating in webinars or going to a lecture, but there's nothing like physically being present in nature and being present in your water to, to be able to learn by doing. So, I asked them what some of their motivations were for walking and folks have said justice, spirituality, wanting to protect the water, uh, restoring their connection to water, bringing awareness 
and understanding that water is sacred. So I felt like this is a really great act um, a really great point in history to share with you and understanding the sacredness of water from an indigenous perspective because it's it's captured um, so well by actual people on the ground who are who are living um, these values. They're hoping that it might come to a National Water Walker Day, which would be great. Um, it hasn't as of yet. This was the biggest water walk that um, was held in 2017 um, when Josephine Menemenba was still alive. She's since passed on, um, but that's her and another elder, um, Edna Manaswabi, um, who uh, were sharing uh, their, um, their teachings and their history and really trying to support this idea of maybe cultivating a National Water Walker Day. There are about, uh, I think about 5,000 people that participated in that walk. Um, and that was walking uh, Lake Ontario um, from two directions. So it was a really, really great experience. And I just wanted to kind of end uh, the talk today with some focus on some other folks that are doing really great work. This is Autumn Peltier. She's the uh, water chief water um, ambassador and chief water commissioner for the Anishinaabek Nation, which is a, a um, a coalition of indigenous nations from Canada. Um, she's 14 <laughs> and she's the chief water commissioner for this, which is unprecedented, but also really cool. And um, it's not a gimmick. She's super, super smart. Uh, she has a lot of understanding of these traditional teachings of these indigenous laws. Um, she is Josephine Manamanba's uh, uh, niece. And so she, she grew up with these, um, with these instructions. And so she's spoken before world leaders at the UN, and she's just um, an outstanding um, up and coming leader, uh, I think, for indigenous water um, law, water justice, and also understanding the sacredness of water. That's how she leads. That's, that's sort of front and center to her perspective. Um, and she encourages other people she know, to do it too. She knows that she can't do it alone. So her go-to statement is that we all need to warrior up. It's, it's, there's no more time for uh, saying, oh, I can't do that, or oh, I don't know about that. She, you know, she really feels like there's, a, there's an imminent need for us to get together, to do this work, to rise, and to build um, protections for the water. And I just want to leave you with, I think, all of this, if we're really trying to say, okay, well, what's the sacredness of water from an, from an Indigenous understanding of Turtle Island, where I'm based? I think a lot of it has to do with treaties. Um, we have original instructions of how Indigenous and non-Indigenous people are supposed to work together um, to peacefully coexist at, and as it relates to water, as well as a multitude of other things. And those were captured um, in our treaties, in those original documents and, um, and agreements that, were, that our ancestors, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, took a lot of time to create. And I think a big part of understanding the sacredness of water and honoring that sacredness into contemporary times is honoring the treaty. So with that, I wanna say thank you to Bhutani for having me. Um, and I'm happy to go into discussion and answer questions and talk more about water. Thank you, Kelsey. That was a really nice presentation, uh, really inspiring. Um, I have three prepared questions that they are really short for you. Okay. And then we will de open the discussion uh, for everybody. So I think uh, you can raise your hand and uh, then you can speak when, uh, whenever you want. Um, could you please stop sharing the screen so we, we see each sure. other uh, when they are raising their hands? Thank you, Kelsey. So these three questions are the following. The first one, it's related to a concept you just mentioned. And I think many of us are really curious about that which is hydrocolonialism. What is mm -hmm. that? How could you explain that concept uh, for people who don't normally work with social science? Yeah, so it's predominantly been used in reference to um, hydroelectric projects uh, throughout history. It's not necessarily a new term. I, I think someone else referenced that. One of the things that um, I've done with some other legal scholars is um, evolve that term to specifically reference water colonialism, to expand it outside of just hydroelectric, um, to any type of water development project that did not have the free prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples um, and was placed on indigenous territories without that consent. So is this related also to water justice? Yes, 
Yes, so we would say that um, a big obstacle to achieving indigenous water justice is water colonialism and the legacy of it and ongoing acts of it that continue into today. Mm -hmm. And what will be exactly be water justice in that context? So I think water justice, uh, it's still being defined within the global context, but at a basic level, it is saying that and I, we frame it from indigenous water justice. So, and I would say that that's where I feel comfortable articulating it um, because water justice at the global level is gonna have other epistemologies involved in it. But from an indigenous perspective, it's uh, making sure that uh, indigenous peoples have uh, the decision-making authority um, over their water um, and over their water resources um, per the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Article 3, which says that um, we have a right to self-determination. So indigenous water justice is framed through a lens of UNDRA um, in, in our research, but there might be others that have um, other articulations of it. So when you were talking about water, you asked at the beginning of the, your presentation, so what is water? And then you change it to who is water? So mm -hmm. would be that changing an object to a subject in a sense that you know, what you first relate to water uh, as it was a resource, but you are basically proposing to relate uh, to water as a relationship, like uh, a family, right? Is that, is, is that like the shift, uh, this mind shift uh, you propose uh, with this Cosmo view, this uh, Cosmo vision? Well, I don't necessarily know that it's, it's not a new vision, right? It's not something that we're proposing for to be created. What we're saying is this is how indigenous people already view the world, um, that water is not a resource. So oftentimes when I'm in management meetings or, you know, high level policy meetings with folks from all around the world and indigenous peoples are trying to add our perspective, that's a big point of conflict or contestation because um, the word resources is consistently used and indigenous peoples, it's not a resource. It's not a resource. What are you talking about? It's not a resource. And, and so what we're trying to, um, before we can have educated conversations, we have to break down some of those epistemological barriers. And one of them is to say, you may call it this, but we actually view it th in this way. And that's why it's important. Um, and that's what, we, that's sort of the foundation we have to lay, to then be able to go into um, more complex conversations. So yes, we view it as a relation and oftentimes those that view it differently view it as a resource. Thank you. Uh, uh, Eli uh, has a question. Maybe you could uh, say yourself your question, Eli. Yeah, sure. Um, can you hear me well? I was yes. just, oh, cool. I was just uh, wondering if you could in a bit more detail explain your research, what you're doing, and then adding on that, um, how did you get started? I mean, your background is quite clear that you have all this inspiration to, to follow this kind of path, but how did you actually choose a topic that you thought, okay, this is gonna help in this manner? And how would you encourage others to do so, something like this as well? Okay, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think I'll start with the path because then that'll probably lead into where I am now with my research. So I, um, was always uh, very much involved in uh, international relations and indigenous rights. So um, right at the height of my completing my high school education was when the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was being signed. Um, and our territory at Shinnecock, we have a pretty close proximity to, to New York City. I mean, it's not, it's closer than other nations in the sense that I'm, I was about a train ride, like a two and a half hour train ride away from, from the city. So I was very much involved in a lot of the events that were happening around um, the drafting of the declaration in the mid 2000s and um, really uh, tuned into those sort of high level negotiations um, from a youth perspective and involved with, there's an indigenous youth caucus. And so there were a lot of those types of activities that were really um, fueling my interest in, in, this, in that area of indigenous rights. And so, I went on to university and was really focusing my studies in, in that um, area of international relations as it pertains to indigenous rights. And my 
a junior year study abroad. I was in Samoa in the South Pacific, um, so another an indigenous community and nation. And I was seeing, um, we were cycling water, the different parts of the island had their water cut off at different times to manage um, water variances. And, um, you know, uh, just other issues about, you know, lack of access to, to water and sanitation. And it reminded me so much of my home territory. And I was just like, how can we be, you know, so many thousands of miles away from each other, but have the same, almost exact same experiences as it pertains to water? Um, both from aspects of, of violence, you know, water violence, you know, not, not having access to water, not having that, that fulfillment of that human right, but then also a spiritual understanding of water. So seeing all of that come together, I wanted to concentrate in that space. I said I wanted to look at, at water rights from an Indigenous perspective as I went on into uh, furthering my education as, as a graduate student. Um, and so that's where I went and did my master's in water science uh, policy and management. And from there, I realized that there was a lot around the law that shapes our experiences and our access to water as Indigenous peoples. And so I went to law school um, to get a better handling within the North American context or, or the common law system of, of legal iterations of, of water law. And when I did that, I realized that uh, many indigenous water law cases are cases of first impression, which means they haven't previously come before a court. And if they haven't previously come before a court, so there's no uh, judicial precedent, uh, the justices will turn to their clerks and to secondary literature to make determinations about uh, the case. And when you look to the secondary literature on indigenous water rights and water law, water justice, there was nothing. So if they were going to make a determination, it wouldn't be in our favor because there at least wouldn't even be any literature for them to look at. So that's when I went on the trajectory of doing my PhD. Um, and that was centered on water governance, uh, predominantly in the Great Lakes region, but um, that's also where our seminal piece um, on indigenous water justice, which was published in a law journal. So now we have this really foundational piece that highlights UNDRIP as an international legal mechanism to employ for the um, effectualization of indigenous water rights. So that's been a big part of my research is, is looking at that, looking at different experiences of water colonialism. Uh, but within the Great Lakes region, it's actually been trying to define the experiences of water governance um, in a transboundary context for Indigenous peoples. So how have um, the nations in the Great Lakes engaged with, here in this part of the world, we have a, a, an international treaty, it's called the Boundary Waters Treaty, that was signed in 1909 between Canada and the U.S. Um, indigenous nations weren't parties to, those, to that treaty. Um, and then subsequent policy documents have framed the way in which Canada and the U.S. Inter interact binationally um, to the exclusion of Indigenous peoples. And so that's where my current research sits. Uh, it's documenting that. It's uncovering innovations um, and ways in which Indigenous peoples have been creative in getting around some of the bureaucratic loopholes and interjurisdictional complexities. And um, now I'm particularly narrowing down from, from that, because there, there wasn't really a lot of research in the area, um, I'm narrowing down to look at the impacts um, as exacerbated by climate change. Hope that answers your question. That was very long, but it's a long story. <laughs> um, better, better also have a question, like a follow-up to Ellie's question. Yes. Yeah, um, and I said that before you started answering. Because most of my <laughs> most of my questions now answered already. Um, first of all, thanks for this presentation. It was super inspiring to me. I actually um, applied for a PhD position yesterday, which is super in line with all you've been talking about, and comparing this to what happens in the Netherlands, which is obviously a bit more of a country that has the the type of we're like managing our waters, and thereby we like know how to handle it and resources like very different perspective but still um also minorities are here um being affected mm -hmm. either way i was quite interested um because once you go into research you have to be objective right that's kind of like what i've always learned how do you feel because this is super based on values i would say how do you feel that 
that is um, how can you take that into research and how can you kind of make it objective enough but actually still you know like what's the position yeah. of your value in your research so there's a, a really great indigenous scholar named Vine Deloria um, and he he's, he's written numerous books but he talks about the myth of objectivity uh, particularly in science um, there is there is no objectivity in science um, and all science uh, pretty much to date uh, has been through a Western lens. Um, and so I think that's a big part of it is trying to really say, okay, there, there is no objectivity in science. We all come with inherent biases. We, we can't get away from them. Um, but I think it's acknowledging them and having that positionality at the front, right? Um, and and a big part of it from my perspective too, and this is just mine, I mean, other people are still going to say that science is objective, okay, that, but that's not my, that's not my viewpoint. Um, and from the way in which science has historically harmed indigenous people, there's no way that I can be convinced that science is objective. Um, there's a whole legacy of biocolonialism too, and, and use of our DNA and, and the use of our remains and there's just so much about science that as an indigenous person I can never be convinced that science historically is an objective. There might be a way for it to be objective in the future but um, that's that's not a priority in my research program. Um, also recognizing that m majority of published science in the past century has been predominantly by white males. Um, I have no allegiance or concern to comfort their dismay about my research, right? That's not necessarily who I'm writing for. I'm writing for indigenous communities, indigenous peoples like myself who have been absent and excluded from the historical record um, and from the scientific record. So that's where I position my research now. But I'm also open to a lot of co-knowledge mobilization science projects. So I love to work with um, scientists who are from totally different backgrounds from including, you know, white male Anglican scientists who have like really stern ideas. Um, I think we're really great together. And sometimes when we put, when we, when we understand that we're bridging two sciences together and we want to look for what are the, what can be some of the shared outcomes, those can be really, really fruitful and innovative projects. So I have one, you know, one in that space that's around ocean governance and, and climate change that's coming forward um, that I think will be really in, impactful. So I'm not so much trying to be objective in science, but am looking for partnerships to co-mobilize different scientific knowledges. Cool. Now I'm even more excited about my topics are really over. <laughs> well, and, and, and good luck with that. I don't know if it's the new wave program, but if yeah. it is, uh, yeah. yeah it is. <laughs> good. It's I heard really it's pretty competitive. For, <laughs> cool. I'll be in touch with you if I get it. Yeah, be. yeah. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to hear more. Probably even if I don't get it, then I'll still find yeah, it. Yeah, that too. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> always, yeah. I always have my ear to the ground on new things that are coming up. We have just one more question, I think, and then we wrap up the session because we are already uh, uh, going to our limit. So uh, Catalina is asking uh, to you, Kelsey, like, is, do you have a similar connection with earth, air, sun, etc.? Why water in specific? You know, I think that that would depend on each of the indigenous communities. I would say the short answer is is yes. There's a there's definitely some elemental understandings within indigenous law and indigenous legal systems that pertain to earth, air, um, sun, etc. But um, I would say, from what I've learned and the distinction that I see with water, is particularly around that that ideology of it being our first medicine. So that natal connection. Uh, situates it differently for a lot of our, our communities. But um, in terms of if you look at it, like what laws do we have against air pollution, against uh, soil contamination, there's, there's tons of uh, indigenous theory and law on, on how to approach the caring and stewardship of those systems. Um, but yeah, I'd also say I, I, it's, it might be out of my, uh, my, my scope of work. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kelsey. Just to add to that uh, question, I think it's interesting because I actually, when we were filming a, a documentary in Chile about sacred rivers, I asked uh, a friend of mine, a Mapuche, a Native American from South Chile, 
about like rivers and I was asking him, hey, do you think rivers are sacred? And he looked at me and he was like, just rivers? I think everything is sacred. Yeah. And it makes sense to me, like what he meant, in, it was like everything res deserves respect. And I think that's also interesting. Like you said, it depends on the person, the culture. I think there are many details, but I think his particular answer was really inspiring because he, yeah, you ask him, hey, is this a, a, a sacred? Everything is sacred. And that's definitely a common, a common answer and, and probably, you know, a good one to, to, to end on. But also to say, um, 2019 was the um, year of indigenous languages. And a lot of these knowledges are embedded in our indigenous languages. So even like water, when you were asking earlier about it being a resource or a relation, the, the conjugation of water is at is as a human, right? So it's not that object, right? When you were asking about object, subject. So I think that's important too when you're asking, when you're thinking about like, well, did we have these relationships with these other elements, with these other non-human beings? Yes. Um, and I think one of the other capturing things about sacredness is there's a common phrasing of, of all my relations, which is that sort of encapsulating understanding of every living being on the planet has uh, has a sacredness and has 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 rights inherent rights um, because otherwise it, it wouldn't it wouldn't exist. Um, but I think it's like getting to that understanding of what constitutes living in one culture versus another. Um, for a lot of indigenous communities, um, things that may not be considered living in Western culture are very much considered living in in ours. So uh, so many teachings about you know you're mentioning earth, but so many teachings about rocks and. Um, you know, also about uh, different types of, of, of climate events. So when we think about air and wind, there's, yeah, there's so much there. Um, and that's why it, it links back to Vera's question about science being objective. Um, I'm not too concerned with that because there's so much of our scientific record that has to be captured that if objectivity is something that we have to put to the wayside for a little while, that, that's okay too, to be able to, I think, get to a point where we're innovating for the health of the planet. Thank you, Kelsey. I think this was a really nice talk and inspiring. I hope everybody uh, got something from it, and I expect so. Um, just to remind you all, uh, we have these open applications for our river camp, where we will try also to address these concepts about water and sacredness, among other tools from science for river conservation. And if somebody has anything to to ask or to uh, any doubt concerning this topic, you can uh, ask us and we will we will connect you with Kelsey if that's okay with Kelsey. And um, then again, thank you Kelsey, thank you all for being here and I hope next time you drink water, you think good about like, what are you actually drinking or who are you drinking? Even not exactly. drinking beer, right? <laughs> Even not drinking beer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good water is good beer. <laughs> well, so, it's really been a pleasure. So thank you, everyone. Well, I think that's it. So bye all and have a nice and